okay, Jim, part two. So I, I found, that, in fact, I found this gentleman's name, Randy Lee, sent us in uh, a question. And it was the classic bar question I was talking about. And you referenced Bjorn. And Bjorn we said he lost two matches of the French to the same guy. Rafa's lost two matches over, what, 15 years. And he's asking, how would they match up against each other, given the equipment is radically different, surface same. Yeah. And the thing that, that takes me, you referenced this earlier, how fast the movement was even then. I, I've, I've had the honor of watching the great tie break at Wimbledon between them with both Bjorn and Johnny Mack. We sat in the studio and watched it. And I remember noticing, because I hadn't really paid attention to this before, 1980, when Mack was serving his lefty stuff in the ad court and Bjorn was, Bjorn was returning serve off in the third row. Yeah. He was standing over there and could still get back into play is what I'm saying. And yeah. it, back then it didn't, you know, I'm watching, it didn't register. It blew me away that Bjorn was able, and of course, John has told me forever the, how fast Bjorn was. So with that as the big setup, yeah. Bjorn and Rafa, if they were to ever play at their prime, um, can we make any sense of that? It's, no, I don't think you really can because the game has moved on so much technologically. It, it just, it's impossible, I think, to even frame that in, in an appropriate setting. I mean, they were both, Rafa still remains so dominant on that surface. And Bjorn, as you referenced, he lost to Panada, the Italian, twice. Other than that, and he just crushed people. I mean, he, again, he was just running through players. And it's just impossible to imagine – you know, because of Bjorn playing with the racket, 65 square inch wood racket versus a player playing with a hundred square inch, you know, nuclear technology in comparison uh, with the different strings and all that, it's just hard to imagine. So for me, it's just more about what would they bring to the table athletically, you know, take the racket away from it. Athletically, the movement, I think, you know, Bjorn may have a slight edge if we put him on a track. He may be a little bit faster at his peak. Um, and then you look at mentally, how mentally tough were they? And I, I don't know that you can pick who was stronger between the two of them. And that, that's saying something, you know, and that, that's – Bjorn was my hero. I mean, that, and that's – I think that's a compliment to Bjorn yeah. to compare him, uh, you know, to, to Rafa's level of uh, concentration and, and consistent intensity out there. Bjorn certainly seemed to have that in my younger eyes when I was watching him growing up. So champions are champions. I think, you know, look, that if you, if you play them, obviously at their peak, Rafa's going to destroy them because there's no way that you're going to be able to handle Rafa's spin with the, with the, the, the wood racket. You're just not going to be able to do it. And certainly not strong at 75 pounds or 80 pounds, whatever, you know, Bjorn had it at. But I would like both their chances if you reverse roles and you had Rafa grow up back in, in Bjorn's era playing with wood. Yeah. And if you have Bjorn in this era growing up with a Babylon racket in his hand, I think they both would have found ways to dominate the French Open. <laughs> One thing, and, and I, again, I was watching Bjorn as a young guy, I didn't really know what I was looking at. So it's different. But I've, the thing that's always struck me, at least about Rafa, was that he was the first player I ever noticed that would be in what I considered a defensive position and hit an offensive shot which coming from other sports are going, wait a minute, that's the whole point. You try to put somebody in a defensive spot and now suddenly, you know, with two strikes and you're facing a fastball pitcher, you're generally just trying to put the ball in play. You're not trying to hit it 500 feet. Rafa was hitting 500 foot home runs <laughs> from two strike positions off on the, on the side of the court. And now we see other players have, I think have done that. Was that ever possible? Like could a board ever have done that with, with the rackets? He couldn't no, they, do that, right? no, they had to play for position. You right. know, when you were out of position back then, the rackets were, were, were flexible. So you didn't have – even if you swung hard, the rackets, they wouldn't support what you were asking them to do compared to today. You had to massage the ball back into court, into position, and play for the next opportunity to be right. offensive. Because players had a much harder time creating power unless they had momentum moving into the ball. These days with these rackets, they're so much lighter, so much more um, – uh, firm that that when you're out of position you can be offensive it's it's the baseball equivalent of giving major leaguers aluminum bats <laughs> it, it just it's pretty simple it, that's what it is these, these players can hit shots that even players as great as Pancho Gonzalez uh, and Rod Labor um, these players 
they couldn't have hit shots the way that Rafa's doing it because they may have wanted to, but the technology wouldn't support it. And now it does. And of course the players take advantage of that. They, they take full advantage of that. So, you know, you got players moving backwards who can hit hundred mile an hour forehands like El Mofis. You know, Jim, something else I was, I thought about this last year uh, during the second week of Roland Garros, and I'm not sure just given reality, if it's, would be relevant even if we do have Roland Garros in September. But I, start, I was wondering this last year, could Roger Federer win Roland Garros if Rafa, if someone else took Rafa out, which he did once <laughs> under that circumstance, 11, now 11 years ago. I wondered about that last year. And of course, yeah. their semifinal last year, Rafa was, it was a horrible day to play tennis condition wise, but Rafa again was, was just clearly the much better player. Yeah. Uh, I think the answer is yes. I think Roger making the semifinals, beating Bavrinka and Root, I think it underscores how great he is on play. <laughs> and he has been great whenever he's, you know, been able to play Roland Garros. He's made, what, five finals? Something like that? I mean, a lot. So he's a guy who, who would have won a lot more than one had Rafa not been there. And yeah, I, I think absolutely. And also factor in that this year, should we play in September, will be the first year that the roof is, is employed. And that uh, as we've seen at, at the U.S. Open, that decreases the wind. And Roger loves to play in calm conditions. Uh -huh. So I think, I think that Chatrier could be even better for him than it's been in the past because you take away those, those you know, brutal conditions that they played in last year in both semifinals. Th those would have, you know, the wind would have been muted significantly if this roof operates in the same way aerodynamically as we've seen the other roofs around, around the world operate where they just kind of take away a lot of the, the, you know, the, the, the circular wind motion. So we'll, we'll see on that, but yeah, I think, I think he certainly can. The question is, will he play? And if it does, if Roland Garros does happen, it, that's a quick turn after the U S open. Does he play? Does he not play? I mean, right. Who knows? And I, Jim, you, you, you didn't want to swing a little bit off our, our line here because you brought up a great point that I've thought a lot about in life during this pandemic, which is that, you know, in certain circumstances, in certain places, this is time that you don't get back. And I've, so now to relevant to tennis, it's Serena Williams, it's Venus Williams, although Venus is really not a, a contender at this point, I think for majors any longer. Um, and it's Roger. And even to a lesser degree, it's Rafa and, and Novak who are into their, you know, approaching mid thirties now. But Roger specifically, I wonder if he thinks differently about playing Roland Garros this year because he'll be, he'll have turned 39 and you, he's not getting this time back. There's nothing, you know, what is he saving it for? A hundred percent agree. You know, in the past, he, it seemed like he was concerned physically and making sure that he was healthy going into Wimbledon mm -hmm. and, you know, he could potentially do something that would disrupt his, his grass court preparation. If, if it didn't go well on the clay, that's obviously not a factor this year because there is no Wimbledon sadly this year and any chance to play a major, um, for, for Roger, if it's not going to hurt his chances to win another one, why wouldn't he take that chance? You know, unless he, there's some sort of a physical concern, it's close by, he lives in Switzerland. It's not a long, long trip to get there. Um, I, I would see no reason if I was in his camp that he would say, you're not going to play it unless you're coming back from the knee issue that he had you know, surgically repaired this year, unless that's not perfect and it's too much of a risk on the clay. If the clay specifically, puts that knee at risk, then you say no, because we want to be ready for the Australian Open where the surface maybe fits a little bit better. Um, but no, I mean, I, I see no reason why he wouldn't unless he has any physical concerns because, you know, they've, they've added that extra week onto the schedule now and we're operating under the big assumption that we're going to have the U.S. Open. That's no yeah. guarantee. We certainly have our fingers crossed. And then you'd have a two-week break and then Roland Garros starts with probably a, a Madrid-Rome thrown in those two weeks for players to, to play some big tournaments on clay if they so choose. That's what I was going to ask. You still, do you think they'll be able to squeeze those two events, Masters events, obviously? Well, I shouldn't say not Rome, but Madrid's a Masters. Yeah, it's, Rome's a Masters too. Oh, They're, Rome is Masters, okay. Right. Yeah, Rome is Masters. There, that is what I'm hearing. Um, and the Italian authorities said that they were making plans to go ahead with the, the Italian Open as of right now. Uh, I read that yesterday, so I, I think that's accurate information. Uh, Okay. Uh, the internet's never wrong, as we know. <laughs> um, well, I think that's the intention. I certainly know that's the intention from the people I talk to within the ATP. They want to get as many of their big tournaments 
um, you know, for, for obvious reasons, give the players chances to go and play, um, fulfill their, their deal with ATP media to be able to get those tournaments out there. So there, there are lots of contracts people are trying to, to live up to and, and get tennis back in front of us, the viewer, which is what we all hope for. Right. All right. I want to swing into tennis in a little bit or some of the other tennis world tennis, but I, before we leave the French open guy, uh, Coleman sent him what just simple from your history, what's the best part about winning the French open? Oh boy. The best part about winning the French open. Well, I mean, look for me, when I won the French open, it was my first major. So that just changes who you are within the tennis sphere for the rest of your life. And, and it offers opportunities like this. I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you, Ted, but for the fact that I became a major winner because you wouldn't be interested. <laughs> <laughs> and you'd be right not to be. No, uh, but, you know, be but, we'd be talking no. about this. We'd be talking about the big red machine and Joe yeah. Morgan. George Foster just reached out to me on Facebook, by the way. George Did he really? Foster. Well, I've really? never met. That, I've never met him either, but I certainly that's something. Man, that's awesome. Anyway, that's an aside, but <laughs> but yeah, look, I mean, the French Open, it's it's a special special place to be able to visit. We're lucky enough to be able to do that most years for for television. But to go back as a past champion is 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 nice too. It, it offers you the opportunity to um, see other past champions within the President's Club. There are certain amenities that come with it. It's it's not quite the same as becoming a member of the All England Club if you win Wimbledon. There's no membership to roll into the Roland Garros complex, but it effectively gives you that type of, of uh, access there for you and for your family and, and certain friends. So it's a, it's an amazing, um, amazing thing to be a part of that history and to feel like you're a part of it. And, and I think I would have felt like, I think every player who plays their period is a part of the history and, and feels something great when they go to any tournament that you play. I, I certainly do. Um, even if I hadn't, didn't have success there, but, it's um, yeah. I mean, it was it was a life changing experience for me, first and foremost, when it happened, and and it's something that I, I still really enjoy every year that I get to go back to Paris. And that was uh, um, Rex. By the way, is an eight year old. I have a oh, friend who sent me that. An eight year old, avid tennis player, and he's part of USTA's Net Generation Ambassadors. That's pretty cool. So that was an eight year old tennis, future tennis stud. We hope. That inspired that away. Um, you, Jim, are so entwined in the business world with your business interests and understanding the, the business of tennis. So I haven't had a chance to ask you this yet. We haven't talked offline even about the conversation about the potential, whatever. I, mean, I know the wording can be sensitive, but the eventuality of the two professional tennis tours ending up, ending up under one umbrella however phrase you want to use, that would be the end result. Yeah. Just, just tell me, what, what, what's been your, over the last 11 weeks where you've heard this and thought about it, what's been your take? So, yeah, since Federer came out on Twitter and said, is, does anyone else think that it makes sense for the ATP and the WTA to merge? That obviously is something Billie Jean King, you know, supported a long time ago. And, and uh, it, it's been a constant conversation. Our, our friend Larry Scott who was the president, the number two in charge of the ATP, and then became the CEO of the, of the WTA. He made a run at, at trying to, to you know, see if that was a possibility and, and wasn't able to do it. And Larry is as smart as anyone I've seen in this sport and now runs the Pac-12 as the commissioner out there for many, many years. So sadly, we lost him uh, to a, a bigger, better job. But um, I think there are certain synergies there that, that make sense. There's no question that uh, – that tennis is at its best when the men and women compete together. The more that we can do that, the better product that we present uh, to the audience out there. And, and in a fragmented uh, world where you're fighting for attention and you're fighting for sponsor dollars and you're fighting for TV eyeballs, you got to put your best foot forward as much as possible. Otherwise, you're, you're moving backwards. Uh, there are lots of challenges inherent in putting this together. I had a conversation uh, on Tennis Channel this, this, this past week. Uh, with Lindsay and Brett Haber and Andy Roddick, and and we're talking about the challenge. There's a challenge also is it it doesn't go all the way um, that you would want to go if you're really going to unify tennis because you still have the four majors that operate operate independent from the ATP and the WTA and, and the ITF, which controls Davis Cup and Fed Cup and the Olympics from a tennis perspective, that are also outside of that purview. So I mean the the, the perfect way from a business standpoint for tennis to maximize its opportunities is to have one voice who can then go out and negotiate 
and have the maximum leverage to be able to drive the maximum revenue and eyeballs and all that and, and make tennis as, as powerful of a business as it can be. And then everyone would share from, from a bigger pie, which, you know, has to be the goal. How do you do that? But it, Andy made a great point in, in pointing out that, the fragmentation has benefited a lot of these powers because they can play the men off the women and the women off the men. And it, it's probably kept more revenue and in the event owner side compared to where the players are revenue wise. So, um, but if you have leadership like Roger and, and the, the male players, if they're open to it, I think the female players from what I've read seem to be, I don't know if you're reading the same stuff that I am, but, seems like there's an appetite to at least explore it now. And that's something that we haven't seen publicly, at least in a while. That's a great point. The, 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 ad, the appetite to explore. I think that's great because look, we all have heard through the years the, from various parts of the globe, cultural differences about equality. Um, the, the, the money discussions as currently exists can be made. But to me, Jim, I, I, I frame this the way I've watched thought about it over the last 11 weeks, very much like baseball again. You said it, tennis, wh whatever exists right now in the, in the separate tours, tennis yeah. is better. Tennis is way better when everybody's together. We see it both, both in the, the major events during the regular tour year and of course the four majors. So I, I think about this as what baseball is going through as we speak. They want to start again. They understand all the limitations. But the two sides, owners and players, are going to quarrel about multi-millions of dollars. And to the rest of us, we sit there and you go, what the heck are you guys thinking about in the middle of this? How can, you pos how can a, a pitcher, their Tampa Bay, who's a Cy Young Award winner, say, I'm not playing unless I get mine right now? How can you say that? So that's, that's where I'm framing the tennis conversation to bring it back, is that mm -hmm. I hope that the sensible, smart people in tennis can just put all of that nonsense aside and say, right now, if we join, we come out better. Right? Everybody's better. Everybody wins. Now, your point that Andy raised may be the, 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 what, the outlier there. And yeah. if there are individual entities that don't necessarily think that they come out better. I hadn't thought about that. Yeah. Well, one of the great things about right now in, in, as we look to hopefully make a move in this direction is that the new CEO and the new leadership at the ATP is that's, that's the platform that Andrea Gadenzi got elected the job in the first place. He came in saying, we want more 10 pole big combined events. Mm -hmm. That's what we need to do. We're not getting enough of the, the global television money that's out there. Um, we're better, we're better than, than what we're being compensated. We're being undercompensated from that standpoint. We're not reaching as many people as we should because we're fragmented and we need more of these big tent pole events like the Indian Wells, like the Romes and the Madrids where you have combined and uh, combined events, men and women, the Cincinnati's, those are the ones that are under the ATP's control and the WTA's control. They're not the majors, but they're the mini majors. And more, the more many majors you can have where you have all the same talent that plays at the Grand Slams operating in one site and operating as one offering for uh, an audience online or on television, you know, the more leverage, more power, or the more interesting you're going to be to sponsors who want to align themselves. So uh, he's been elected with that as his mandate. And obviously things have gone upside down with this crisis. It's to stop momentum. On, on a lot of that stuff because they're just simply trying to figure out how to, to safely get tennis back going again. But I, I believe there is an appetite. I know there's an appetite. Uh, so I've spoken to him about it in, in Australia this year to try and get more of those events. Is that a precursor to actually uh, joining the businesses and finding those business synergies and, and that leverage? Maybe it might be, but even if they're, even if they still exist separately and they work more together, uh, work, tennis will benefit. What, one thing I've wondered, Jim, I talked to um, uh, Bob Moran a few weeks back who runs the Charleston event, the longtime strong women's clay court event. Yeah. And I was asking him about this. Is there a thought that coming out of pandemic with all of the obvious travel difficulties that are going to be to have regional tours, to have an America's tour, to have a European tour, you know, Australian, you know, the, the, the geography there makes it hard, but you could have an Australian season 
uh, which they kind of do anyway. But I'm, I'm saying I was thinking along the lines of what the PGA, why can the PGA come back? Because it's an American, a North American tour, really, right? Yes. 90, probably what, 90% of the players are in North America. You don't have the travel issues that tennis is going to face. So does something like that coming out of this pandemic make any sense? There, that's being discussed, I know, within, within the power structures. They, are, they have had discussions about that. I haven't, from what I've heard, the appetite for it isn't quite there yet to, to fully pursue it, but it is being bandied about. So it, your, your thoughts uh, are, are being echoed in the power corridors of tennis, um, from what I'm hearing, and I have great sources, people who are in those rooms, yeah. and so do you. Um, you know all these same people. And we'll see, you know, if the travel bans uh, need to, to continue to protect the world, to protect people from you know, the virus spreading, it'll be challenging, uh, if not impossible. But we've seen in America, they've already given exemptions for athletes to travel in to play the PGA, LPGA, WNBA, NBA, MLB, and ATP and, and WTA. Those were all included in that guidance by our government that says we will make exemptions for these athletes coming in to participate in professional events. That's super positive for the Cincinnati's, the Washington DC's, the US Opens. It doesn't help us with Canada. Uh, the Canadian Open, the Rogers Cup cannot take place because it's either Montreal or Toronto who have, have banned um, public events of that size until yeah, Mon September. Montreal has. Yeah. Montreal. So it doesn't help from that standpoint, but it, it does give some optimism that we can play from that standpoint. And will that be offered in Europe or in France and in Spain and in Italy if those are the three events that take place right after the U.S. Open? Um, that will make it practical for players to be able to play without needing to go quarantine for 14 days in advance. That would make it very difficult, I think, to have the tour as it exists now. And that would make your regional tour a much more logical solution. Well, I know, Jim, you, through your company, um, with your partner, John Benison, you were involved in this, what was burgeoning this year was the Challenger Series, right? The Oracle Challenger Series. Yep. Is, is that something that, that grows even more? Do you suspect coming out of this? To get, because it is, a, in a sense, it is an American tour. Yeah, so Inside Out, the company that, that John and I formed a long time ago, we, we got our start doing senior tennis in America and still run the Champion Series. And then we partnered with Mark Hurd and Oracle to, to put together, to, to fulfill Mark's vision on adding more opportunities in the minor leagues for American tennis players. And that remains unclear as to how that's going to shake up from here. Uh, again, we're waiting for guidance from, uh, you know, from the ITF on, and the ATP and all that stuff as to when the, all tournaments are going to be allowed to start. Right now we know nothing starts until August 3, and we'll see where it goes from there. But we're, we're going to see if that uh, continues to be a passion project and a business move for Oracle or not. Who are you listening to right now? Who am I listening to musically? Yeah. yeah. Oh, gosh. Um, Jim's, Jim's been one of my music gurus, by the way. That's why I'm asking this question. Yeah, I mean, um, the new Pearl Jam record, uh, I got excited about that. That came out. Um, so I've been listening to that. So that sort of, you know, throw, tell, tells you how old I am because they're <laughs> right in my sweet spot. And they're not that we're old, but we're not a new band. Um, I think if I have any new bands that I'm totally infatuated with that I can tell you about. Let me look on my phone because this is there where <laughs> this is where we all have our music these days. One of Jim's one of Jim's friends tipped me off. This was maybe a year yep. or so ago to yeah. a, a big release, the REM a catalog from BBC, a oh, bunch yeah. of live BBC recordings Very over right. decade, two decades probably done by REM, and I yeah. love. I still listen to that all the time. Love it. I'm, I'm going to, I'll screenshot you this playlist that I put together when we're down in Australia. Okay. There's a cool, there's a cool band called Wild Dorado, like Colorado, but Wild Dorado. Yeah. You, you should check them out. I think you dig them. Very, very good. Um, there's a kid from England named Sam Fender I've been listening to for a couple of years. Hmm. Who's really talented as well. Uh, but check that. Um, yeah, there's all kinds of stuff out there, you know, new bands like, like Michigander and uh, Briston Maroney, you know, I, you can, we don't go to record stores anymore. Now my record stores like Apple Music or Spotify, you just kind of flip through and figure it all out. But um, you got all that stuff. And then my, my kids, Ted, um, my kids love 
like we will rock you from Queens. So we've been playing that a lot. Wow. I don't know how they saw it somewhere, or it was probably on some like TV show that they saw. Yeah. But that's on our, our playlist in the house here quite a bit. You want to date us the last dance when that aired. Man, what a what a renaissance that had to give Alan Parsons project. Holy right? gosh. There's some unreal music in that. That was a <laughs> phenomenal, phenomenal <laughs> dot. Yeah. Do you have any anything new you're listening to or anything old you're listening to? Um well, I've I've been I've been actually really using and through it's a family uh, hook into YouTube. So I've been using YouTube quite a bit during the pandemic to bring up live recordings of, you know, just bands I've liked through the years uh, that are now cataloged and you don't even know it. They're cataloged on YouTube, just like tennis players go watch matches, right? Of someone they're going to play that they may not be familiar with. That's the same thing. Things I've never heard of. And we used to die, right? please re- release a live recording. Please release a live recording. And a lot of artists, Billy Joel, for example, was renowned for never wanting to release live. He didn't like his live. Um, he thought live was to be experienced live, not to be experienced afterwards on a CD. Uh, yeah. Anyway, YouTube is a great, you know, it's, we know it's the world's greatest library. Yeah. And it goes, it goes that way for music. So I have uh, actually a band that still plays out of uh, North Carolina called the Connells. They were oh, yeah. I love the Connells. 80s and 90s band, but they're still together. Most of the original guys are still together and they still play shows. They still go play fairs and shows like that around the Southeast. Yep. And I go find a bunch of their stuff on YouTube and that's fun. It's fun. Another yeah. band called the Feelies. Yeah. It was a Jersey cool. band that was an REM influence. They were a big influence on REM. Yeah. Uh, uh, the Feelies have gotten back together and of course they're now you know, kind of like in my world, um, but they're still playing and they still play shows in and around the Northeast. Yeah. So anyway. Yeah, we're, we're both, we both need to check out this new documentary called Laurel Canyon that's just coming out right now on, uh, on one of the, you know, epics or stars or one of those, those things. But it looks like it's going to be amazing about that era of those artists who lived in Laurel Canyon, you know, uh, Linda Ronstadt and Jackson Brown and, you know, all those bands that the doors that were up in there living in that little artist enclave. So that that should have some pretty cool footage, too. I think it just came out last night. So we'll, 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 we'll end with my music reference. I had a chance on New Year's Eve to go see the dead. In a unique experience, uh, I had seen my wife and I had seen them play in the 80s out in the Bay Area uh, with Garcia, of course, still being alive. So we went and saw them New Year's Eve and we were the guests of Bill Walton. Now nice. that is <laughs> an experience because we were on the stage as yes. they walked out to start and Mickey Hart walked by and said, hi, <laughs> and, you know, and then we obviously, once they started playing, we had to leave and go, go down, but, yeah. but to be there and to be in the midst of that aura and the, you know, Mickey Hart, the 76, maybe something like that. The three long running surviving original dead members are all in their seventies and they love this. They and John Mayer, yeah, who I had never seen before, and I've heard James, our friend James Blake, talk a ton about it. Um, talk about him rather. John Mayer was phenomenal. I had no idea how good John Mayer was because he now is he's he plays the Jerry Garcia role. He's a shredder. He's incredible, incredible. Oh, and I, again, it was wonderful for me to see because I was just I had I was blank slate about John Mayer. I just, you know, knew of him but didn't know much and. Yeah blown away by how good he was. So the end of the story is I find out that uh, Bob Weir and, and Mickey Hart and Bill Kreutzman, the two drummers, would play 75 to 100 nights a year if they could. But John Mayer, because he's doing other things, only commits to so many nights with what's now called Dead in Company. Yeah. I think he does 25 or 30 nights a year he commits to them. Uh, yeah. And, but it's amazing because these guys are in their seventies and would still go, they are just roadies and they would not stop. So that to me was, that was the most fascinating learning experience out of that whole night was to find out how these three guys just can't make this, you know, they're like Roger, they won't stop. Why, why would they? They're, <laughs> they're doing something they love to do. People love to see them do it. It is exactly why Roger shouldn't stop. He's great at it. People love it. Serena the same. As long as they're having fun, we'll, we'll have fun watching them. Right. Amen. Well, we thought, Jim, I thought this would be fun to just catch up with you. It's always great to catch up with you. But during this week, we're supposed to be championship week in, yeah. in Paris for us. And so, uh, you know, I, like I said, I, I personally am just fatigued about watching 
old matches. So I thought it was nice to talk about today's tennis for a while. So uh, it's, it's been a breath of fresh air. Good. It's great to see your face too, Ted. I'm sorry good. we're not sitting side by side in Paris, but. What do you think? Up. You're looking good. Looking good. You're looking, you go. Dude, you're looking tight. I am in total soft. I'm actually beyond soft mullet. It's pretty much a full mullet back here. You got to get Mary involved. This is all Susanna's got the clippers and all this <laughs> stuff. She's got, she's got three little boys hair. She got to take care of. I'm just the oldest little boy. <laughs> well, the sad part is none of it's up here, but. Uh, actually, when I get back in the saddle in a few weeks' time, we'll have to figure out something. So okay. I don't know. I, I was a, I sent Roddick an email when I saw Roddick buzz at the beginning, and I was I said, "Man, you you have this you have the stones. I don't have that. I can't go that route yet, but I may I may have to." You, you can get there. The Clippers are the easiest play. Just get the Clippers and put the number four or three on, and just, yeah, it's done. You don't have to worry about it. All right. All right, Ted. Good. Great seeing you. Thanks for having me. Say hi to say hi to Suzanne and the boys. Well, hopefully I'll see you in person, I hope, somewhere soon. I think we will. I'm going to be in California before too long, so yeah. I suspect I'll see you before you know it. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm down there, and, I, and we'll be – my son and his wife are living in Santa Monica, so I'm going there anyway when the baby's born in July. So, I don't know. Hopefully there's tennis. Yeah. All, right. All right. See you, Jimmy. Bye Thanks. Thanks, Ted.